And the car pulled in front of me, forced me to stop. And there was uh, four men in the car, three of whom got out. And one came to my door in the car, pulled it open, hit me a punch in the nose. And I sort of blacked, I must have blacked out for a minute or two. Because whenever I came through, uh, there was nobody else in the car, Gusty was away. Gusty Spence, leader of the outlawed Protestant extremist organisation, the Ulster Volunteer Force, was kidnapped in Belfast a week ago. He was out on parole from Crumlin Road Jail, where he'd served six years of a 20-year sentence for shooting down a Catholic barman. In the heart of the Shankill, where Gusty Spence was brought up and where his organisation is strongest, there were growing fears for his safety. Had he been abducted by his own side, or had he been kidnapped by the IRA? World in Action went in search of Gusty Spence. After six years in jail, Spence has become something of a martyr and a folk hero. Gusty is king in Crumlin Road Jail, or was king in Crumlin Road Jail. He was rare around here and he's one of us. And he was condemned for something that they never proved he did. Why is he such a hero on the Shankill? <laughs> That's a good question. I just don't know. Uh, possibly the people who feel that he is a hero, that they could maybe be better suited to answer the question than I can. I'm the brother of Gusty Spence. He's a bit of a manager when he's a wee fella, that type of thing. But uh, Gusty's a popular man. He makes friends very easily, very quickly. There were five boys, two girls. Uh, my oldest brother, Billy, is first, uh, and next, um, Jim, he's an ex-boy, Bobby's an ex-boy, and Edward is the next, and Gusty's the youngest boy. Gusty Spence kept up the family traditions, becoming a junior Orangeman when he was only eight. Like many other Shankill men, he joined the British Army, serving in Cyprus as a military policeman. Back in Belfast, he joined the Prince Albert Temperance Loyal Orange Lodge, which became the focus of his social life before he went to jail. Tell me about how you feel now that he's out. Well, to be honest about him, highly delighted. Do you think he's safe? I don't know. But surely if he was safe, there would be reports of him. He would be about to no-go areas. He's not. Someone has reported the UVF have him. Who's to say that they have or they haven't? I certainly don't know. The government didn't know either. His disappearance couldn't have come at a worse time for Mr. Whitelaw. The day Spence vanished, the Protestant no-go areas were made permanent, crippling army and police efforts to trace him. But the rumour spread through the no-go areas that he was in safe hands. At the pirate radio station behind the barricades, the mood was confident. This is your own territory, and our souls still come into you. Now, the next request we have is a very, very special request. And it's for our own Gusty Spence. Well, now, Gusty, this comes from all the people of the Shanka Road, and they're all very, very happy that you are where you are. So this next request comes from all your loyal people on the Shanka Road to our own Gusty Spence. They haven't searched far enough, Gusty. I'm not in your town to stay, and I'll soon be on my way. I'm just here to get my baby out of jail. Oh no, they will never find Gusty. Yes, Warden, I'm just here to get my baby out of jail. You should never have been there in the first place, Gusty. I tried to raise my baby right. I have prayed for day and night that he wouldn't follow the footsteps of his dad. I have searched both far and wide and I feared that he had died. But at last I found my baby here in jail. That was from for our own Gusty Spence from the people of the Shankill Road. Good luck, Gusty.
On a Shankill Street corner where they campaign for the release of Protestant prisoners, the Orange Cross organization does a brisk trade in Gusty Spence souvenirs, booklets, badges, and even poems written by the prisoners and smuggled out of jail. The mythmakers have done their job well, but the official record of the UBF tells a different story. May 7th, 1966, Martha Gould, an elderly Protestant, killed when a bomb intended for a Catholic bar went through her front window. Ulster's Lord Chief Justice called it the work of the UVF, a seditious association directed to maintaining the Protestant ascendancy by overt acts of annoyance and terrorism. May 26th, John Scullion, mistaken for an IRA man and gunned down in the street. The UVF publicly claimed responsibility. Spence was accused, but the charges were withdrawn. June 26th, Peter Ward, an 18-year-old Catholic barman, shot dead after a late-night drinking session at the Morven Arms. As he stepped out of the side door, UVF gunmen were waiting for him. Gusty Spence and two other men were charged with the murder and convicted. Spence's conviction was controversial. At the preliminary hearings, the magistrate ruled that there was no case against him. Ulster's Attorney General overruled the decision and sent Spence for trial at Crumlin Road Courthouse. His application to be tried on his own was turned down. The three men were tried together, found guilty and sentenced to a minimum of 20 years. Spence's appeal was rejected and petitions to successive Home Affairs Ministers were also turned down. Spence had served six years when last weekend he was paroled for 48 hours to attend his daughter's wedding. On his way back to jail, he was kidnapped. World in Action found the man who did it. He cut off the spring for road and he went up straight on up the spring garden. And they had an ambush there for him. I saw his car coming down with two men on it. Who was driving him? Mr. Curry. So the papers tell me, anyway. The car came down, we ran the car. And two men went out and lifted the cost out of the car with a bit of resistance. And you're saying that that was not an arranged job? He didn't know that that was going to happen? He didn't know it was going to happen. Why did you do this? Well, I think this man here was treated in his trial in 1966. It was a political trial, as far as we were concerned. And this man was sentenced for something he didn't do. Do you think it's really in his interests, though, that this should happen? Well, if we can get him a retrial, it's in his interest. And the interest of this country. The UVF is the most secretive organisation in Ulster. For six years, no one has known for certain whether it was a myth or a well-camouflaged reality. Last weekend in Belfast, a World in Action team were blindfolded and driven to a secret destination. There we were confronted by armed UVF men and the missing man himself, Gusty Spence. Mr Spence, how did you come to be free last weekend? Can you describe the incident? Well, it was very little to describe. It happened so quickly. And uh, I was bundled from one car into another. At that particular time, I didn't uh, I didn't see Jim Curry being struck. I was too busy uh, looking around about me to see who uh, was in the point of apprehending me. Are you seriously saying that you didn't know that it was going to happen? Very seriously saying. Does that mean that you're now being held by the UVF against your will? Well, I'm being held by the UVF, yes. yes my Lord. Are you being held by the UVF against your will? Yes, you could say that, yes. But you are the commander-in-chief of... The no, that's untrue. You're the chief of staff of the UVF? No, that's untrue. You're the leader of the UVF? That's untrue also. Although you are lifted without your knowledge, and although you're being held against your will. Are you pleased or sorry that you're out of Crumlin Road Jail? I'm pleased. Uh, freedom is uh, God's <coughs> greatest gift to man. And anyone that would say that he's not pleased to be out of captivity, uh, he's a fool. Mr. Spence, you were tried in the courts and found guilty of murder. Are you saying you didn't get a fair trial? Yes. Uh, what most people forget was the fact that I walked out of a low court, a free man, uh, whilst charged with the same offence. And in the eyes or in the front of 50 million people, I can tell you, as I told everyone in 1966, I did not shoot Peter Ward. Honestly and sincerely, with all the, uh, the sincerity of my command. You were nevertheless convicted in a British court of justice, and your appeal was squashed. All I know is that uh, I was refused a separate trial and uh, 
who went through this farce of a trial. If any of you gentlemen uh, had been there in 1966, you would have seen it for what it truly was, a farce. So your claim is that you're completely innocent and that you were the victim of a political conspiracy? It is a claim and it is a fact. One of the men convicted with you, Hugh McLean, yes. made a statement to the police which was used in evidence in court. Yes. And according to that statement, you and other UVF members had a big drinking session that night and at various pubs ending up in the Malvern Arms. And into the, into the Malvern Arms that night walked four men with southern accents including an 18-year-old boy, Peter Ward. And this is what McLean says in his, or said in his statement in court. He said, quote, Spence did most of the talking. The conversation came up about the religion of these fellows. Spence went up to the bar beside the four lads to buy a drink. When he returned to our table, he said, I have been listening to the conversation of these fellows, and they are four IRA men. They will have to go. Then these men were shot. The uh, I would say I would say number one, if uh, how does one tell an IRA man and uh, four IRA men did go into a bar? Would, would they certainly speak about their membership of the IRA? No, I, I will let the people out there judge me on what they've heard and seen tonight. Uh, whether this statement is true or not. A statement of court used is a uh, is it it's inadmissible as such, and uh, I let the people be my judge. Two other people at the trial gave evidence against you as eyewitnesses of the of the murder. Were they lying too? Yes, of course they were. You're saying, if I understand you rightly, that the statements that were made in court naming you were made by people who were part of a political conspiracy against you? No, what I'm saying is this. I'm saying that, that uh, Hugh Arnold McLean had been under interrogation by the special branch for two full days. And uh, it has been proven of late the inadmissibility of statements. Statements have been thrown out of the Northern Ireland courts, uh, right, left, and centre of late. Uh, as I said before, 1966 was a bad year for loyalists. And 1966, uh, men were given, uh, policemen were given an awful lot of latitude, more than they are being given today. What's your case for a review of your trial? It's simple. Uh, I feel. Uh, very, very strongly that I should have been given a separate trial in 1966. Uh, during the past six years in Crumlin Road Prison, uh, I feel stronger now than ever before that I, I should get a separate trial, a retrial even, a separate trial. What do you think your chances are of uh, persuading Mr. Whitelaw to grant a review? I would think excellent. Tell me about the formation of the UVF before it was banned. Uh, I can't tell you anything about the formation of the Ulster Volunteer Force. Are you saying that you were not involved in the UVF in 1966? I'm not saying that. I'm saying I can't tell you anything about the formation of it because I don't know. Right. Can you tell me how you came to join the UVF in 1966? Yes, I could tell you, but I won't. Is it true that you're chief of staff or have been chief of staff no the it's completely untrue again it's part of the myth it's part of the things that go on in people's heads for which i'm not responsible what rank do you hold in the uvf again i won't answer that what rank did you hold in 1966 to the people i won't answer that you would accept however that you were a member and played an active part in the uvf uh, i would accept that i was i had an association with the Ulster volunteer force yes just uh, a month before the Malvern Street murder, a message was sent to the Belfast newspapers in the name of the Chief of Staff of the UVF. Perhaps I can remind you of that. It said, From this day on, we declare war against the IRA and its splinter groups. Known IRA men will be mercilessly executed without hesitation. We are heavily armed Protestants dedicated to this cause. Do you remember that statement? I remember a statement that I'm not too sure of the word, to be quite frank. But again, as I say, the, uh, to my knowledge, there is no chief of staff of the Ulster Volunteer Force. What is the leader of the Ulster Volunteer Force called? Well, it's a matter of conjecture what he's called. But the UVF put out that statement in no, the name no. of the organisation. Someone put out a statement. 
Are you now officially denying on the I'm on behalf of the UVF that that statement was made by that organisation? I'm not in a position to officially deny or confirm any statements put out by the Ulster Volunteer Force. You see, the UVF is obviously, uh, it's a very mysterious organisation. True. Uh, people know very, very little about it. Uh, what can you tell me about it and about your involvement in it? What I can tell you is this. The myth was a reality and is a reality. What differentiates it, for instance, from the UDA or the New Orange Volunteers Organisation? Well, as you can see, uh, or if you have seen, uh, we are a militant force, a purely military force, with no allegiance to any particular party. You've got guns? Yes. And you're prepared to use them? True. And you have used them? Yes. When? On various occasions. Against? Against anyone who would usurp the constitution of Ulster. You also formed a UVF unit in prison? Uh, there was already an Ulster Volunteer Force unit in Belfast prison. And you became the leader of that unit? Being the senior officer, yes. What kind of contact did your UVF unit in prison have with the movement outside? We had close contact. How? By various ways. Can you suggest any of the ways? I could, but I won't. Did you have regular prison visits? Oh, yes, yes. Every prisoner is entitled to. It all depends on the length of time he has to serve and uh, the length of time he has served. Every prisoner, the more time that he has served, the more, vital, the more visits uh, to which he is entitled. Isn't it the case, in fact, that you continue to run the UVF from your prison cell? No, that's quite untrue. What kind of relationships did you have with Republican prisoners? Did you ever talk to them? Did you discuss politics? Did you discuss the present situation in the province? One cannot make friends with people who are attempting to overthrow our constitution and uh, our British way of life. You say that, but when the official IRA leader, Joe McCann, was shot dead by British troops only a few weeks ago, you wrote an extraordinary letter to his wife, which I may read to you. Yes. You wrote, uh, My dear Mrs. McCann, I would like to tender to you my deepest and profoundest sympathy on the tragic death of your beloved husband, Joe. There are those who would find it strange to hear from someone such as myself, but I can assure you that whilst your husband and I may have been opposed to each other in politics, we shared that common bond that is known only to those who fight their own respective corners to the best of their ability. He was a soldier of the Republic, and I a volunteer of Ulster, and we made no apology for being what we are or were. I salute your husband as an honourable and brave soldier. You wrote that letter to the wife of an official IRA leader. True. That may seem strange to many of your followers and fans on the Shanko Road. I don't see why. Uh, General Erwin Rommel was uh, an honourable soldier and uh, Queen Marshal Montgomery paid him respect. Uh, one should not misconstrue the letter. It continues there where Joe McCann spared the life of two men, spared the lives of two men. That was the good time that was mentioned in the letter. That is the main reason why I wrote the letter. You refer to the common bond that is known only to those who fight their, their own respective corners to yes, the best of, of their course. ability. What do you mean by this There's common, a common bond? bond? There's a common bond amongst all soldiers, all honourable soldiers throughout the world, as has been proved since time immemorial, whenever a flag of truce is hoisted. An honourable man never fires on a, flag, uh, on a flag of truce. It's respected. Uh, if we have to fight a war, uh, I say that the war should be fought honourably, and to the best of one's ability, but, but honourably. You feel that you have more in common with men like Joe McCann fighting on the other side? No, I didn't say that. No, no, there's a common bond amongst all soldiers who fight their own respective corners. It's simple, it's clear. I'm surprised then that this common bond wasn't felt more in 
prison itself and that there wasn't more cooperation. Well, let me put it this way. There weren't as many honourable men in Belfast prison, in my opinion, as Mr. O'Connor. It's possible to be an, IR, an IRA man and to be an honourable man. Uh, in exceptions, yes. What do you think of the present loyalist leadership or the contending leaders? Well, uh, the, the present leadership uh, speaks for itself. They've got us into one hell of a mess. And uh, the sooner that they amalgamate and put whatever differences there are to the one side and think of the people the small people, the half nuts. One has only to look at the shangle road. We call it the heart of the empire. That heart has been torn out. It lies now and it lies bleeding and uh, it lies disrupted. We have no one squalor who have been born and reared in it. No one knows better than we do the meaning of slums, the meaning of uh, deprivation, the meaning of suffering for, for what one believes and uh, that would be any ideology. There has been some form of uh, deception in so far as people speak about 50 years of misrule. I would not disagree with that. What I would say is this, that we have suffered every bit as much as the people of the Falls Road or of any other underprivileged quarter, in many cases more so. Are you now going to play an active part in, in politics or in the struggle here? I'll play an active part in uh, the life of Ulster. What kind of part? Any part that uh, fate happens to throw up. What part would you like fate to throw up? I would like fate to throw up a peaceful part. Apparently it may not throw up a peaceful part. And you're prepared for something other than a peaceful part, if necessary? Well, I am an Ulster man, a loyal Ulster man, and I'm prepared to do what the province asks of me. What role do you think the UVF should now be playing? I would think a leading role. Uh, I think perhaps that uh, it shall take a more active role than it has been taken hitherto. Many people are very worried at the moment by the growing spate of apparently random sectarian murders. Somebody on the Protestant side and somebody on the Catholic side appear to be murdering people of the other persuasion in a quite random fashion. What do you have to say to people on the Protestant side who are doing this at the moment? Random killing is to be deplored at any time. And I would say that uh, anyone that uh, would do and engage himself in the sectarianism to cease it. On the Shankill, you're regarded as a hero. You're, you're seen as a man who recognised the IRA menace long before the present troubles blew up and took certain actions against that menace. But it seems that those who regard you as a hero and a leader have got it all wrong. You're saying you didn't in fact take the actions attributed to you. What I'm saying is this. Uh, I didn't take the actions with which I was charged. Uh, I'm not saying that I didn't take any action. Uh, Gusty Spence is a myth. The Gusty Spence, the person that sits before you now, is truly a humble and sincere man. Some people would say, uh, Mr. Rector, that's a matter of conjecture. I am sincere in anything that I have ever done. And I shall be sincere in anything that I shall ever do. Uh, as far as the hero bit's concerned, it's nonsense. <laughs>